Are we back in Spain? I love Carmen. No, it's the other Bizet opera. Hi, my name is Charles Carson, and I'm Associate Professor of Musicology and Ethnomusicology at the Butler School of Music at the University of Texas at Austin. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to our production of The Pearl Fishers by Bizet. Now, before we begin, I always like to take this opportunity to welcome our opera newcomers. Um, those people who are coming to the opera maybe for the first time or they haven't been in a while. Uh, and make sure that you feel comfortable and welcome because we want everyone to have a good time here. So if you're an opera expert, you've heard me do this spiel before, feel free to just forward past this part. But for those of you who are newcomers, here's some common questions I often get. Number one, <laughs> what do I wear? It seems like the most obvious question, right? Like before you even leave the house, what are you going to wear? Well, the short answer is just be comfortable. Um, as long as you're here and you're happy, we're happy. And that's really the most important part. So please come as you are and be comfortable. Um, number two, is it expensive to go to the opera? The short answer is not as expensive as you think. It's actually pretty cheap. Uh, it's a lot cheaper than most of the, the pop concerts I go to, to be honest. But here's the thing. You can choose any seat you want, right? You don't have to sit in the most expensive seats. You can sit in the nosebleeds, like right next to me, and we'll have a great time. The singers start on stage and they can project and feel the entire stage from anywhere in the building. You can hear them. They use no amplification. It's only their voice and the power of their voice, making sure that everyone has a great experience and hears the music in, in the same perfect clarity all over the building. So choose the seat that fits into your budget and I'll see you there, right? And then the next big question I get is, do I have to speak the language? What I mean by that is opera comes in a lot of different languages from obviously English to French, German, Italian, Czech, Russian, many, many others. And you don't have to be fluent in that language to understand the opera. Matter of fact, that's one of the best parts about the opera is that the music's going to carry a lot of information and enhance the language. So when you're in the building, though, don't worry, because right here, right above the stage right there, we're going to project translations in English of whatever language is happening on, this, on the stage in real time. So you can glance up, get a sense of what they're singing about, and then let your eyes fall back down and just be, you know, washed over with the music and the beautiful singing. So don't have to worry about being fluent in any other language, even English, right, for the, to enjoy the opera. The last question I often get, very common question, is are they really going to sing the whole time? For the most part, the answer is yes. There are certain subgenres or styles of opera in which you may have dialogue spoken, of uh, acted on stage. But for the most part, um, operas such as we're going to see today are what we call sung through, as in they sing from the beginning to the end. Now, this may seem daunting at first, but in most styles of opera and traditional styles of opera, like we're going to see today, they use a little bit of a different differentiation between the styles of singing to help you understand when there's sort of dialogue happening and when they're stopping to sing a song. So when they want to, to, to communicate information about the plot or give information, a lot of information quickly, then we use this sort of type of singing that's a mix of speaking and singing we call recitative. And recitative is uh, a version of heightened speech. So they'll elongate some of the lyrics uh, to make them sound like a uh, sung language so that you can follow along with the, with, the, uh, with the text that goes by pretty quickly. And again, you're gonna be using those, those super titles a lot for these kind of sections. But in addition to that, in contrast to that recitative, you'll have what we call the aria section in which they sort of stop and dramatically sort of reflect on what's happening. And often these happen outside of real time. It's like a like a, a Hamlet soliloquy or something where that's happening inside their mind or it's a duet between uh, two lovers or a trio or a quartet or a quintet or a sextet or all the way up to having a whole chorus on stage. Uh, 
So the difference between these two types of singing, right, the recitative, which is more like dialogue, and the aria, which is the song, the sort of famous parts, to be honest, um, well, that will help you sort of pace yourself through. You'll know exactly when uh, when the really romantic stuff's about to happen because the orchestra will sweep up under it and someone will start singing a beautiful melody. So those questions are often very, very common, and I hope that really helps to alleviate any of your fears. But I will also say this, if you're an opera newbie and you're here for the first time and you're unsure about anything, feel free to ask anybody because quite frankly, opera people love to talk about opera, such as this video. The Pearl Fishers is a 1863 French opera in three acts by Georges Bizet with a libretto by Carmen and Carré. It premiered in Paris, at the Théâtre Lyrique, at, when the composer was only 24 years old. The Pearl Fishers was Bizet's second staged opera, and he composed it relatively quickly. He started it in April, and it premiered in September. As a result, he reused a lot of stuff. Earlier unstaged operas or other concert works, a lot of those things found its way into the Pearl Fishers. The plot itself is influenced by a lot of contemporary and earlier works, especially those dealing with priestesses who are falling in love. Uh, one example would be Norma. And you see a lot of that style in this piece. In its initial run, it ran for 18 performances. Uh, it's not a bad run for a piece. It was revived after his death in the wake of the success of Carmen in 1875, and Carmen itself only initially ran for 36 performances. The piece got mixed reception, and by that I mean the audience relatively liked it, but the critics did not. The critics blamed him of Wagnerism, of being too much like Wagner. And we now, with our contemporary ears, really can hear that they might have been thinking about the chromaticism and the harmonies in the piece. But most famously, Berlioz. The famous composer actually liked it. He saw a lot of potential in the 24-year-old composer of the Pearl Fishers. Now, one thing to acknowledge is the history of exoticism that follows this and many other operas. In particular, this opera is what we might think of as, as an Orientalist opera. Uh, it's, it's something that imagines the East from the perspective of the West. And this is a very common thing, especially in the 19th century. Now, in contemporary opera productions, we try to address these issues um, in the production, in, the, in the, the planning, in framing it for our audiences. And that's, that's part of the responsibility of the opera companies and of the individual artists, is to address these issues in such a way that holds on to the spirit of the piece while st still being respectful for the communities, real or imagined, that it tried to represent. And the ultimate goal, of course, is to bring this beautiful art form to a wider audience and make sure everyone feels comfortable and welcome in these productions. Bizet was born in 1838 to what was effectively a musical family. His father was a music teacher, as was his uncle and his aunt who taught at the conservatory. Early on, his mother taught him theory and piano and he showed an early talent as a child, so much so that they enrolled him at the Paris Conservatory at the ripe old age of nine. By the time he was 19, he'd won the Prix de Rome, which is a, 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 um, an award established by Louis XIV to send French people to Rome to study art and culture and kind of work on their own thing. Um, during that three-year period, um, he worked a little bit on some works, many of which never actually uh, came to fruition. And to be fair, when he came back to Paris in 1860, he did flounder a bit. Pearl Fishers was one of his early mild successes um, up until Carmen uh, in, in 1875. But unfortunately, he died just three months after the premiere of that piece and never lived to see the full success of what eventually became the most famous opera in the repertoire. So at his death, he probably thought Pearl Fishers was one of the best things he'd ever done. Now, there's been a lot of criticism of the plot, which, to be fair, is quite thin. 
Um, it hinges on at least two improbable things happening at the same place at the same time with the same people. So, you know, you have to give it a little bit of uh, leeway. At the center of the, the story are four individuals. Um, you have Leila, the soprano, who is a high priestess. You have Nurbad, who is a bass, who is the a priest accompanying her. You have Nadir, who is a who is a, in this case is a tenor, and Zurga, who's a baritone. Those two guys are best friends. It really centers around those two guys love, forbidden love, for Layla, the priestess, who is supposed to remain a virgin as a means of making sure that all the pearl harvesting goes safely with no one getting injured or, or killed. So when the, they meet all together on the island of Ceylon, modern day Sri Lanka, it becomes kind of a embroiled situation as they compete for the love of this woman that neither of them are supposed to have. It's really a story of duty and honor versus the heart. And in that way, it's kind of pretty standard fare for opera. And in fact, a lot of the criticism of the plot comes down to the, the poor libretto, quite frankly. And the librettists themselves admitted this, saying that if we had known that <laughs> Vizet was going to write such great music, we would have tried a little bit harder. So for that reason, we say that this opera is better than it should have been, elevated a lot by the lush, lush writing and beautiful melodies of Bizet's score. Now, as a whole, the opera follows a pretty traditional structure with alter alternating recitatives and arias and then adding in duets and choruses for the entire ensemble. So as such, it's pretty easy to follow in terms of pacing. The beauty of it lies in his use of melody. This is really the piece where he came into his own as a melodicist. Um, and a lot of the most famous excerpts of this piece are melody driven, and especially some of the stuff we're going to talk about a little bit later. But I don't want us to ignore the harmonic ingenuity of the piece. Really interesting harmonic shifts and modal sliding sideways, beautiful, colorful uses of the orchestra. The orchestra itself is not especially exoticist. Um, if you look at works later on, like Turandot or, or Madame Butterfly, in this case, there are a few moments, and I'll think of, uh, I'll mention maybe the, the oboe opening to, to the second act that really draw on sort of non-Western music. But as a whole, there's really no effort to make any kind of um, copy, if you will, of South Asian music. And this is most likely because a lot of the piece was borrowed from existing works, reusing sections and reworking sections from, from operas and, and concert works that hadn't been staged yet. And a great example of this would be the hymn to Brahma was originally written as a Catholic Te Deum. So this is the kind of stuff that we're talking about when we think about the sort of uh, efficientness of this work and the tightness of this work in a mere two and a half hours of running time. Now, since operas can be hours long, I often find it very useful to focus on a few key moments to serve as anchors to help orient you throughout the piece. And in this case, I've chosen three, one per act. The first act one is a no-brainer. It is perhaps the most famous male duet in the entire operatic repertoire. It's the first act duet between Nadir, the, the tenor, and Zerga, the baritone. And this is sort of a male equivalent of the flower duet, from Lakme. And that makes sense because that piece would have been composed around the same time that Pearl Fishers was being revived in the wake of Carmen's success in the 1880s. Now, in this piece, uh, the two male leads sing of renewing their vow of friendship after they both fell in love with a woman during their visit to the Holy Temple. Now, in, in the opera, uh, in the, the orchestration of this uh, duet in this opera, you see the use of the flute. In, in opera worlds, the flute normally means uh, women, it means sincerity, it means relig religiosity, it means emotional intimacy. So you can think about pieces like Casta Diva from Norma or the Mad Scene from Lucia de Lammermoor. Um, and in this case, they're both singing about a woman, so it makes sense that the melody is first presented by a flute. She's sort of present and absent at the same time. 
And when they begin, they sing kind of around the melody for a, for a minute before they finally, in the, the duet proper, converge and sing a harmonized version of that melody. And it's a beautiful, lush moment of, a, of musical arrival that's really driven by this sort of root bass motion that makes you feel like the melody is always sliding and falling forward inevitably to this beautiful, beautiful arrival moment at the end of the scene. It's a powerful piece. It's a beautiful melodic moment in the opera. And I think you'll agree that it deserves to be one of the most famous in the repertoire. The second key moment is also a duet, this time between Nadir, the tenor, and Leila, the soprano. Ton cœur n'a pas compris le mien. Your heart did not understand mine. Probably the best translation. In this case, it's an interesting moment because it both moves the plot forward and it provides a, a lush moment to sort of sit in the music. It's actually one of the interesting parts of the opera where you do have a strong sense of exoticism in the opening sort of oboe cadenza that's supposed to evoke generically the East. Now, what's happening is after they've met and uh, they've sort of reconnected um, by one of the many moments of chance that make the, the to make this plot kind of very impro improbable, she dreams of hearing his voice again. And in her dream, you hear him singing off stage. Now, as a plot device, as she wakes, he arrives on stage and he's singing there in front of her. It's a beautiful moment of staging that's really, really interesting. As she pleads for him to leave and, 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 and begs for him not to break his vow or hers, this moment of transition happens. First, he sings about how he loves her. She sings how she reluctantly loves him. And then in the middle section, the music turns turbulent and they sing sort of against each other, trying to convince each other that they're not in love. Until finally, like you can imagine, they sing the original melody again together now, harmonized, which in opera code means they're in love. So it's musically a melodic moment, but it also pushes the plot forward as they finally consummate their love. And in doing this, it's a very modern moment in opera uh, com composition, one that really sets Bizet apart from some of his contemporaries. Now, it's a little hard to choose a third segment for Act 3, because Act 3 is really where a lot of the contrivances come home to roost, so to speak. But I've chosen one that I think is a beautiful moment and repays a closer reading. Uh, the, the duet between Leila and Zurga, Je promis, je chancelle. I quiver or I falter, I shake. It's a beautiful moment in which the plot kind of starts to tie itself up into a tight knot that will have to be resolved in the latter half of this act, right? So another example of Bizet doing more with less um, in a musical setting, uh, given a rather thin plot. So I know it seems kind of crazy. Um, everything has to pay off pretty quickly at this moment in the opera, but it's it's not unlike a superhero movie where the, where the, the, the superhero arrives at just the right moment to fight the bad guy, right? So in this case, what's, ha what's happening is Leila entreats Zerga to spare Nadir after, after he's broken his vow. And he's almost convinced to do so until Leila offers her own life for Nadir. And as, at this moment, Zerga realizes that, that she, in fact, loves the other guy. And he proclaims his jealousy. And when she asks, why? You're jealous. Why? He yells, because I love you. <laughs> 
And that is a peak moment of this duet where everything sort of comes to a head. And it's a beautiful moment because now it sets up the entire dilemma for the final part of the opera that has to be resolved. This, this intense three-way love triangle that is built up between a, the, the sense of duty, the sense of love, the sense of brotherhood, all these things coming together. It's a beautiful, beautiful moment. And I know that it seems a bit convenient that everyone just happens to be at the right place at the right time to make this happen but i would say it does this beautifully so just go with it So there you have it, a nice introduction to a beautiful opera. Um, I really hope that you'll join us at our production and give the other opera by Bizet a chance.